We're in James chapter one, talking about doers, not hearers. And there is a, a danger, uh, really, which is what this is about. Uh, there is a danger, of course, that we will know what God wants, um, but not actually do what he wants. <laughs> That's basically what it comes down to. I mean, there's this, I guess you might call it academic knowledge of the scriptures, um, which is to say, well, you kind of know what they say and you know where to find things and that kind of thing. But then when it comes to your own life, your own choices, they may not reflect the knowledge that you have. And that's where we have hearers, not doers. Deceiving ourselves, though, is the, the real trick. Uh, it's a self-delusion, not something from outside. We're not talking about error being taught or you know, people telling us things that are not true or misleading us or anything of that nature. Uh, we're not even necessarily talking about pressures to do the wrong thing from coming from the outside. Bad influences in life or whatever it is. Those are all bad, of course. But this is about me and the things that I tell myself that let me, if you will, or let me think that I'm getting away with it. <laughs> and I have to be honest enough to take an inventory of the self and take a good, honest look and reflect on that and, you know, do something about it. Um, course we're getting this from James 1 22 be doers of the word not hearers only deceiving yourselves and that's the the verse that gives the lesson its title and uh, that's fair um but I think there's you know there's more to it if you look at everything that's being said there and think about it um there's more to this Way back in that fifth verse, he said, if anybody lacks wisdom, you could ask God for wisdom and he will grant it. Uh, there, there is supposed to be wisdom. We're, we should have wisdom, certainly by reason of time, um, you know, maybe not of age. If, if you, you know, sometimes people obey the gospel late in life and, and they may have this world's wisdom and they may even have genuine wisdom in some cases, but, you know, true wisdom comes from the word of God. This is talking about our experience, knowing the Bible, uh, hearing the Bible, teaching the Bible, and, uh, of course, living it. If there's something that we lack in this matter, we should ask God about it, and we'll get it. So, again, we're talking about ourselves and what we know and what we could know and what we should know. Um, there's, you know, I don't accept a whole lot of shoulds. People try to put shoulds on me all the time and I don't accept a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, I'm told that that keeps going as you get older. You start <laughs> You start caring less and less what people think that you ought to be doing. <laughs> but in this case, God is right. And God is always right. And what his book says we should do, we should. Uh, that's actually, you know, when he says it should be so, that's just a polite commandment. He's being gracious. But if God says you should do this, you better do it right now <laughs> because he's being nice. We've all had that boss, you know, well, we've all had bad bosses and good bosses, right? But you've all had that boss where the, 
you know, it would be great if somebody could, and you do it, and they're happy with you, or nobody does it. And the next time it's, hey, why is that not done? Right? First thing was, it'd be great for somebody. The next one is, hey, what's going on here? Did you not hear me? Oh, well, I mean, you just said it'd be great. You didn't ask me. Oh, really? You don't work here? Right? That's how it goes. So don't let God's shoulds become, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. Let me think about that. No, 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 no. It's just a very polite and gracious God. That's all. Don't be fooled. If you lack that wisdom, ask God. And you'll get it. There's no reason to stay in the dark, for one thing. But in the context, you look at it, he says in the 16, 17, 18, don't be deceived. First time here, don't be deceived. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's his will that we exist, that we are born in Christ, and that by the word. And again, remember what he said, everything that is good and perfect comes from God, the father of lights. He does not have a shadow or variation, and this, this language is really talking about the dark side of the moon, which you may or may not have ever noticed, but you actually only see one side of the moon. It always has its back, you know, facing away from us. We never see that side of it, and so we don't know what that looks like or what's there which is a great basis for some fun, you know, alien invasion movies. <laughs> or some towering human achievements of the 20th century in rock and roll. <laughs> but truly, God doesn't have a dark side. There's nothing hidden there. There's nothing behind his back. He's not holding out on us. He's not keeping anything back. This is the meaning. Don't be deceived. Everything that's good, everything that's perfect, everything that's useful, that's from God. He's not keeping anything back. He's not holding out on you, lying to you, deceiving you. That's not it. If you're deceived, it's self-deceived. Don't be deceived. That's what he means. He brought us forth by the word of truth. That word that is the word that we obeyed. We became Christians because of what he said. How could we not trust what he says? We exist because of what he said. That's what leads up to the title here. The 21st begins, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which can save your souls. The word implanted, which is a reference to the parable of the sower, in which the sower goes out to sow, and the seed is the word of God. The implanted word can save your souls. When it says it's able to or it can do so, this is a reference also to the parable of the sower, which you may remember in the first case, there was no plant. The birds came and ate the seed. In the second case, there was a plant. But the soil was rocky, and the sun withered it. It gave out very quickly. In the third case, there was a plant, and it grew up and lived a full plant life, but it never bore any fruit because it was choked by the cares of the world. And in the, that's the third case. In the fourth case, a good plant on good soil bore fruit. So when he says the implanted word can save your souls, he has a reference to instances two and three where it planted, it sprouted, 
but to no avail. There was no salvation there. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer of the word, he is like a person who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and walks away and immediately forgets what he looked like. One who looks into the perfect law, law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. It wasn't clear what he was saying. <laughs> he made it clear. <laughs> no point in being religious if you're not going to live right. That's what it comes down to. What about this mirror? Well, he looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Uh, natural face. We mean it's him for real. It's not a portrait of him, a representation of him. It's the real thing being reflected back. That's the thing about a mirror. <laughs> it doesn't lie. Snow White aside, the mirror does not lie. When you look at that thing, it is live. It is real time. You are seeing exactly what is there in exactly how it acts and responds and et cetera. That's what you're doing. And if you look intently, at the natural face in the mirror, what's happening here? Well, assuming you're not Narcissus, you are looking at that so that you can gather some information. And Narcissus loved looking in the mirror uh, because he loved the visage of himself. He loved himself. And it's a very odd Greek thing. Forget it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that when you look in a mirror today, I know people carry them like sometimes or they used to. I don't know if anybody does anymore with the advent of phones, <laughs> but used to be at carry a compact, you know, had a little circle mirror, you know, a little flat disky clam thing. You know what I'm talking about. Why did you have that? Right. Well, because it gives you real time, actual presentation feedback of what is here. Why do you want to know what is here? Because maybe you have lipstick on and you don't know if you missed or if something has wiped it off or you just ate a brownie and you don't want anybody to know. So you're looking to find any little, right? Or you are a teenager getting ready to ask that cute person on a date and you're looking to make sure there isn't anything on here that's embarrassing. It needs to be removed first, right? In the morning, before you head out the door to work or whatever you do, you're going to look at a mirror first. Why? You look and see, is the hair ready? Is the teeth ready? Is the face clean? And all these things, why? Well, it's clear why. Because it tells you what's really there so that you can do something about it. And you do. And you do it then. And some things are easy. Walk away, you know, wipe this off, spit shine, whatever. But some things require a mirror, don't they? Sometimes you're thinking, yeah, that has to go. Let me get some tweezers. And then you need a mirror because you got to be able to see what you're doing 
and the effect that it's having, right? All of this is just stuff that people know. That's why he says what he does. When you're looking at the natural face in the mirror, you're doing it so that you can do something about it, so you can correct anything that is amiss. That's why. So if somebody hears what God's word is and doesn't actually do it, it's like looking in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what you saw there. It's like walking away and forgetting what you saw there. Like you, you see this big old smudge on your cheek from the brownie. And yeah, <laughs> I would go to Walmart anyway. You wouldn't do that, I hope. A little bit more self-respect. Take something off of there. But that's what it's like. You saw something that is out of place, perhaps embarrassing. It's not appropriate, right? But you walked away anyway and just, yeah, whatever. Left it there. You knew it was there. And you walked away and left it there, un untouched, unaddressed. Does anybody do that? No. And I mean, I know very well that there are some things that cannot be fixed by mirrors. <laughs> a lot of what I see amiss is when I look in the mirror, I can do nothing about. I just have to walk away. <laughs> but no, truly, we're talking about imperfections, actual imperfections here in a person's character, right? If you are looking into God's word, God's word is a mirror. You are looking at the perfect law, the law of liberty. Why is that perfect? Well, it's perfect because God made it. But what's perfect about it? Well, most laws are made to catch you doing something and penalize you for it. This law is made to set you free, law of liberty. What does it liberate you from? It liberates you from your sins, from your faults. When you look into the mirror that is God's word, you see yourself as God sees you. And when you see that, you see the sin, if there is sin, which is not necessarily true if you're a Christian and you're living right. At any time that you look at this, you may find, no, that's okay. I did that right. That is okay. But if there is sin, it will show you that there is sin. And it will show you what to do about that so that you can be free from that sin. So if you look at that and you persevere, persevere. Well, you know, this is where you really understand that the it's time to leave the... Um, it's time to leave the comparison of the mirror. You know, nobody perseveres at a mirror unless you're talking about plucking sessions. But really, we're clearly talking about living a Christian life, persevering. You look at this thing to check how are you. If you do that and you stick with it, and you don't just hear what it says, but you do what it says, that will be blessed in doing, not in hearing, not in knowing, not in regurgitating, not in reporting, in doing. Which is why if you think yourself religious, but you don't control your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. And you might think you're religious, but that religion is worthless. It has no value. What's the value of being religious and not living right? There isn't any value. In fact, there's negative value. You cut over to Romans 2 with me. There's negative value. What do I mean? Well, take a look. God doesn't show partiality. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by that law. 
It is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God. It is the doers of the law who will be justified. Yeah. People think sometimes, or they ask sometimes, are you, are you going to be lost because you weren't baptized? The answer to that, strictly speaking, is no. You're going to be lost because you sinned. Baptism, yes, is how we obtain the blood of Jesus and get forgiveness, becoming a child of God, the first time. That's true. It's the start of a, of a Christian life. But no, what kills is sin. People sin without law. They'll die without law. People sinning under the law will be judged by that law. And the law of Christ doesn't make provision for sin. So no, if, if you sin, whether you're baptized or not, that's destruction. Sometimes people uh, don't want Romans 2 to be, to be ours, right? Sometimes you think, ah, well, this is not for me. This is for the Jews. And, I, you know, I'm of uh, Spanish descent. So uh, clearly I'm not Jewish. <laughs> and I'm a Gentile. No, I want, I want you to change that, okay? And the reason, I can give you a reason. <laughs> In the end of Romans 2, these, these are the bookends, right? 28, 29. No one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly, nor a circumcision outward and physical. A Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Do you see, though, precisely there in the 29th verse that he said, the circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter? What kind of Jew are we talking about? Well, it's true they did have actual Jews at that time and actual Gentiles at that time, meaning people who previously had no word of God proclaimed to them in the, in the formulation of the law of Moses or the prophets and the Jewish nation. That was true at that time. But it's very clear that's not what he's talking about. He's saying... Those who have, if you will, entered into that covenant relationship with God, which circumcision was for the Jew, and baptism is for us today, we are being, uh, we're being changed in the heart. And we are brought forth by the Spirit. Those are Christians. It's the person who believes in God, who is a Christian that is really what we're talking about. I understand that the analogy is physical Israel in the days of the Romans, and that he is very clearly teaching about integration of Jew and Gentile and the, the changing of um, the times that you know, clearly was happening in a momentous way in the first century. I understand all of that. And I wouldn't, wouldn't say otherwise, wouldn't let anybody teach otherwise. But you should understand that when Romans speaks to the Jew, it's really speaking to those who have been brought forth in the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. It's talking to those who are Christians. So what does this have to do with <laughs> hearers, not doers? Well, did you see the 14th verse while you were over there? When Gentiles who don't have the law by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law in an accommodative sense, which he explains in the next few verses. Let's skip on down to 17 there. If you call yourself a Jew, but, he says, but if you, recall, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law 
and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. If you are sure you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Well, you then who teach others, don't you teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say one must not commit adultery, do you? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who are boasting in the law dishonor God by breaking that law. As it's written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now think about this for a minute. Who can say they have a different name from the rest of the world? Who can say they depend entirely on the Bible, book, chapter, and verse? And whoever boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Who has known his will? who has been able to make the choices in life that are the right choices, the excellent choices, not the bad choices, who has been taught from the Bible, from a young age, from your parents perhaps even. Who is that? Well, it's you. You're the Christian. You're the Jew in the book of Romans. Those of you who are Christians, those of us who are Christians and have been Christians for years, we are the Jew in Romans. Understand it. Especially those whose parents were Christians who were brought up hearing only the Bible, not brought up among the Gentiles in some pagan religion or no religion at all, hearing things about God that were not true or were false. That wasn't you if you were brought up by Christians. You're the Jew. And I am the Jew because I've been a Christian since 1990, which is what, 33 years now, right? Yeah. There's no question I'm Jewish by now. <laughs> I mean, I'm an Austinite, and I've been in Austin for less time. And I'm not from California either, so I don't say I'm an Austinite after about 12 months. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you guys. Are you sure you yourself are a guide to the blind? A light to those in darkness? That's a good question. I mean, shouldn't I be able to teach the lost? Absolutely. If somebody knows nothing about God, knows nothing about his word, shouldn't they be able to find out through me? Shouldn't I be able to be the light in that situation? The person who stands up for what is good and right? The person who can answer questions about God, about his Bible? Well, it should be the case. Instructor of foolish, teacher of children. Yeah, who do we bring, you know, who do we make teacher in our Bible classes? It's Christians and experienced ones. You have in that book, the book of God, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. It's true. The Bible is knowledge. The Bible is truth. So you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Well, that seems obvious. Well, yes, of course I do. <laughs> While you preach against stealing, do you steal? Oh, no, well, of course I don't steal. Really? What about that little Roman temple down the, down the street there where they have the prostitutes set up? 
you pay the prostitutes at the gate, of course, and engage in whatever it is that they're offering so that you can gain access to inside the gate. And once you're inside the gate, there are statues, there are idols set up everywhere, and people walk about. So do you, uh, because you hate those idols so much, do you go pay the prostitutes to get in the gate, to get behind the wall where nobody's watching and steal idols? Uh, I'll get them. I'll show them. That's what he's talking about. Is that what you do? Why say this? Because they're thinking, oh, that's not stealing. That's retribution. That's battle. <laughs> Convincing myself, right? Self-deceived. Oh, yeah, stealing is wrong. But I would never steal. I might take things that are not mine, but I'm doing it for the Lord. It's tricky. If that's the case, and you say that you know God, the fact that you're breaking his law is dishonoring God. Actually, in fact, people around you who see you acting that way and living that way, God's name is blasphemed. Oh, well, he's a Christian and he's here with us. Right? Always remember. I always remember the old story from Tom, from Tom Roberts. Interesting what an influence he was. But anyway, um, not that he's not still around, but I mean, on my, on my thinking for years later, he was an influence. That's interesting. But anyway, I always remember the story that he told about a fellow he had known who had been, who had gone down to one of the, you know, kind of beach parties, it's kind of wild, people kind of dancing and various states of clothing and drinking and drugs. And he was a Christian, but he was thinking to himself, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to see if I can bring this up. At some point, he gets one of the girls aside and just talking with him, starts asking her, do you go to church? And she says, you think I'd be here? Ooh. No. She was correct. No way you should be there. How are you there? Right? You guys say, well, y'all should come to church. Well, who are y'all? Well, all of y'all sitting around me doing uh, drugs. Wait a minute. Why are you there? What are you doing sitting there with people doing drugs? What, what business do you have there? name of God is blasphemed among the nations. The Gentiles, they don't know any better, and they're never going to if we live like that. Right? Self-deceived is what this is about. And, and there's all kinds of things that are like it. I remember the woman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd come... You'd be in church in the Sunday best, the dress and whatever, but if you happen to be in the neighborhood driving through there that afternoon, she'd be out in the Daisy Dukes in a bikini top doing the, the hedges, whatever else, you know. And little girl, daughter says, Mommy, didn't you hear the preacher talking about that this morning? And she says, Honey, he has to say that. That's deceiving yourself, see? Deceiving yourselves. But it doesn't fool a child. And it certainly doesn't fool God. You know, in the final analysis, I'd go over to 2 Peter 1. There are qualities that a Christian should have and build on top of faith and love and self-control. And so many things there that I will leave it to your own study. He said, if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, will these keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus? Whoever lacks these qualities, though, in verse 9, is so nearsighted that he has become blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Spiritual blindness here, but it's a spiritual myopia. That's what the doctors call it, myopia, short-sightedness. 
you can become so short-sighted as to be blind. What is he saying? He said, what did you used to be? And what are you now? And how did you get here? That's what you got to ask yourself. I do this all the time. What did I used to be? What was it? What was that like? Have I left my first love? How did that change? Why did that change? You got to take these inventories of yourself. Or has it become so nearsighted as in I, I'm only thinking about the now. I'm only thinking about right here or, you know, the next day, not thinking about the big picture at all or where I've been or where I'm going. Right? That's the other way of looking at nearsightedness. But the point is you're, you're flying blind. Forgot where you came from. Which is why the 10th verse said, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And now you got three of them. You're thinking to yourself, well, I might have misunderstood James. <laughs> no, James was clear. Paul was clear. Peter was clear. Everybody is being very clear about what's happening here. We have to mend our lives. We have to live what we hear. We have to do what we hear. There's so many things that we don't have time for. But we have to do what we hear. And it, you know, it starts as simple as treat others how you want to be treated. That's what Jesus said. The love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others the way you want to be treated. That's the, the, the simplest starting point. And the thing is, just like in Romans, where the fellow's got this elaborate scheme to work out vengeance on the idols, <laughs> people get these elaborate schemes about getting back at somebody or punishing somebody for what they've done and, you know, well, they deserve that. They should, you know, they're getting what they, you know, you, you reap what you sow. You know, this kind of thinking. Never considering what if that were you? What if you were in that position? What if the way that you think it is isn't really the way it is? Wouldn't you like people to give you the benefit of the doubt? Wouldn't you like people to put themselves in your place before they speak and say something ugly or mean or condescending or accusatory when there's no wrongdoing, perhaps, or a misunderstanding, perhaps? There's so many things that are like it is what I'm getting at. So like in Romans, where this fellow's got this elaborate scheme worked out where he's going to get vengeance against idols because he's so gung-ho about hating idols in the name of God that he forgot, oh yeah, but you're not supposed to commit fornication and you're not supposed to have fellowship with the table of demons and you're not supposed to steal. He forgot about all these things he was doing wrong in the name of a thing that he thought was right. That's how we trick ourselves. So also it can be with these things, right? We think, well, what somebody needs is a good shellacking or a good correction. Well, maybe they do. You might be right. And, you know, if they're taking nominations, I probably have a few myself, but that's God's business. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You and me, we're servants. Let's be kind and give the benefit of the doubt. There's so many things like it. I'll have to let you make the application for yourself in that regard uh, or think of other examples for yourself. But really, we all have to take this inventory. We have to look in this mirror and think about it. Is our, does our life actually reflect our knowledge of what God says and what God teaches? And can others really come to know God through us and through our example? Maybe they can. I don't say that because... Uh, you know, obviously nobody here is doing this. <laughs> I say it because it's what the Bible says. We're teaching the truth here. Um, you know, this is about 
putting the shoe on if it fits. You have to check, though, whether it fits. You've got to do the inventory. Here's what it teaches about the matter. So, yeah, we've got to be thoughtful about this. We have to look. We have to check. And we have to act on that when we see it, as soon as we see it, before the devil takes it away. Yes, deceiving ourselves, not a very nice trick, but unfortunately a very effective one. Because then we stop listening and we stop accepting correction. And in fact, we get mad at anybody who would correct us. (laughs) Well, that can't be right because it disagrees with my foregone conclusion about my rightness in this matter. Well, these are the things to think about. But again, I would encourage you. Sometimes you look in the mirror and you say, okay, this is all right. We did this correctly. I, I did, Yes, this is what God said to do. This is what I have done. And that is good too. It's good to get that feedback, that encouragement from the word. It's not all bad, but you do have to be honest and you do have to look and you do have to change when something is amiss. Today, if you are not yet a Christian, you need to become a Christian to have for yourself forgiveness of sins. We indeed have water prepared and ready to help any that need to be baptized in the name of Christ to begin that life as a child of God with a new heart, with a new aim. So don't hesitate on our account. We're trying to make things as easy as possible for you to obey the gospel at any time. It's the most important thing that there is. And that's unqualified. It is absolutely the most important thing that there is. There's nothing more important ever at any time than obeying the gospel of Jesus. If today you are a Christian and have not lived right, you also need to repent. And just like baptism for forgiveness of sins, remember what he said. There's no partiality. Those who have sinned without law will be will die without law. But those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And there's no room in Jesus' law for sin. If you've been living in sin or doing wrong, repent and make things right with God and do it immediately. There's nothing more important. If you need our prayers, we'll pray with you and for you. Because we're all in the same boat. I need this. You need this. You're thinking to yourself, well, I think he's talking to me. Yes, I am talking to you. And I'm talking to me too. (laughs) That's God, though, not me. It's his word. That's what happens when you use his word. It's pretty sharp. If today we can help you with our prayers and we can help you to obey the gospel, do not delay the salvation that you desperately need. If you need our prayers or need to be baptized, let it be known while we stand and sing the song selected.